Joe Marchant is a science journalist whose first book was shortlisted for the Science Book of the Year Prize in 2009. Called Decoding the Heavens, it told the story of a 2,000-year-old scientific instrument fished up from the bottom of the Mediterranean. Now she's turned to something even older the mummified body of the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun, discovered with his fabulous treasure in 1922. The Shadow King tells the sometimes bizarre story of scientists' efforts down the years to uncover the mummy's secrets. We invited her here to Broadcasting House so we could meet the author. Joe Marchant, what did you set out to do with this book? The first thing I set out to do was just to look at all the different scientific studies that have been done on the mummy. I'm a science journalist and I'd covered a couple of them and um, it just it seemed as though different people were coming into different conclusions and that wasn't something that was coming across when you watch these big budget documentaries. Um, you'll see a very dramatic story that comes to this great final conclusion about Tutankhamun and when I spoke to the scientists involved um, there was actually a lot more uncertainty and controversy behind that that wasn't coming through. Now, the mummy was discovered uh, famously in 1922 by Howard Carter, and it's significant, partly obviously because of this extraordinary treasure house of objects, gold, and other jewels which were found with it, but also because it is the only mummy of a pharaoh discovered in modern times that had never been disturbed. Yeah, that's right. So um, his tomb is in the Valley of the Kings um, in Egypt and other royal tombs had been found, but they were empty, looted long ago, and other royal mummies had been found, um, but they had been stripped of their valuables and sort of rewrapped later on and bundled away in these caches. So it was completely unique to find Tutankhamun as he was buried in his tomb, surrounded by all of his treasure. And there are these dramatic pictures of the discovery and Carter and his assistant breaking their way into one of the chambers of the tomb. And also uh, when they got in there, the, this extraordinary enormous sarcophagus, gold sarcophagus with other coffins inside it, like a nest of Russian dolls and the, the mummy in the middle. Now, Carter was one of the first generations of professional archaeologists. He was very methodical in recording what he did. One of the things he did in 1925 was get an anatomist, a man called Derry, to do an autopsy on the mummy. And there are photographs of them preparing to do the work. And that was a, an important move, wasn't it? That was quite a significant moment because previous to that, some of the other royal mummies had been unwrapped in as little as 15 minutes and it was just an exploded mess of just bandages on the floor and they just ripped through everything. Nothing scientific about it whatsoever. And although Carter and Derry have been criticised a little bit since, they took eight days to unwrap the mummy. They were meticulous about it. They took photographs at every stage, recorded every tiny thing they found and the location in which it was found. And when they got through to the body itself, they were a little bit disappointed because they were hoping that he would be in perfect condition because he'd been found intact. But actually the conditions he was kept in um, were a bit damp. So the mummy had it wasn't um, quite as pristine as they'd hoped. It was quite black and quite charred from all of the unguents that had been poured over him. Um, but they found that he was a young man, died at around the age of 18, and that wasn't known before the mummy was found, very little was known about this king. So that was the first major thing. Um, they didn't find any obvious cause of death, but he did have an extremely wide skull, um, which immediately suggested that he was related to another anonymous uh, pharaoh's mummy that had been found. So those were the two main things that came out of that first. And those, it seems to me, are really the only undisputed facts about the mummy to this day, aren't they? Because there have been lots of uh, subsequent investigations, there have been x-rays and CT scans and there's been DNA analysis but all of those subsequent investigations which have come up with lots of conflicting ideas you would argue are compromised partly because they were funded by television companies. Yes pretty much every other finding I would say has been disputed and we can't really say I can't really think of anything else that we could really say for sure about him, which is amazing when you think about it. The millions of dollars that have been poured into some of these studies. And as you say, yes, they have all been funded by different media companies. There was an effort in the 1960s to x-ray the body. That was um, for a BBC documentary. Um, National Geographic and Discovery among the, the Discovery Channel are among the other companies who've funded CT scans and DNA testing. And, and that... I think is a bit of a problem because they are naturally looking for something very dramatic. They're looking for this sort of one-off breakthrough conclusion and that isn't really how science works. So there is a kind of big tension there between um, 
the difficulties of finding out anything for certain on such an old mummy, 3,000 years old, that's been through so much, and what an audience is going to want to see. Now, a lot of the scientific studies have been designed to work out, trying to establish how Tutankhamun died, and indeed why, because he was only 18. And there have been lots of theories. You quote uh, the theory in 2002 that he was murdered, a uh, theory in 2005 that he died of complications after breaking a leg because one of his leg bones is fractioned. Then there's the theory that he was a sickly lad, he had scoliosis, he had a club foot, he might have died of malaria. Um, most recent theories, uh, he might have died of a fatal chest injury, may have had inherited epilepsy. Are any of these theories really reliable? Well, we don't know, is the short answer. And I think... Uh, what's your theory? What do, what I, do you, well, which do you think? I, I mean, I, I don't know either. And part of what I wanted to do was not follow in that tradition of, oh, and here's the next new theory. This is the truth about Tut, and now we know. I mean, I have a favourite theory. I'd rather like the idea that he was trampled by a hippo. Um, this comes from the fact that the mummy doesn't have a chest, so no, the front part of the ribs are gone, the stern and the heart. Um, and that's very unusual for an Egyptian mummy, that the embalmers were usually very careful to take out the internal organs without affecting the overall body, and they left the heart in place, very important. So th there must be some particularly strong reason why Tut doesn't have those things. And one theory is it's because he suffered this injury before death, so the body never had that just you know, to start with. Now, we can't do an interview about Tutankhamun without mentioning Tutankhamun's curse, which you obviously, as a good scientist, would debunk. But is there anything uh, scientifically that might underlie this notion of a curse? Well, what I love about the curse is the way that it's changed over the decades. So whatever people are interested in and excited about at the time kind of gets reflected through the curse. So it all got started when Lord Carnarvon, who funded the whole Carter's whole enterprise of discovering the tomb, um, died a few months after the tomb was discovered. So that's what kind of set alight this whole idea of the Pharaoh's curse. And initially there were serious discussions in the newspapers about whether this was evil spirits who were sort of avenging um, Tutankhamun. But then a bit later on, um, that kind of went out of fashion. People didn't believe in ghosts anymore, but it was all about um, aliens and ancient technology and had the Egyptians booby-trapped the tomb and was there sort of cyanide poisoning or laser guns or whatever it was in the tomb that would, could kill people. Um, a few years ago, there was a clinical trial into the curse. So looking at people who had been present when the tomb was opened and people who were in Egypt but not in the tomb and looking um, very rigorously at how long they all lived. Um, and that concluded that um, they didn't die any earlier. So that's, that's the latest. Joe Marchant, thank you very much indeed.